we'll get to the actual technical arguments here. You're welcome. So basically they say the minute that he dies, any human being could be a prophet, a righteous servant of God. The minute he dies and you ask him for help, suddenly this becomes shirk. So let's examine this very important subject in an academic way. And their main argument is that what these you know, sects do, for example what the Shia do by seeking the wasila, is exactly what the pagans would do with their idols. And the Quran does condemn that. What did the pagans do? They would go to their idols and ask them for help. They would seek blessings from them, they would ask them for help, ask them to cure them, ask them to bless them, ask them to give rizq and sustenance. And they're like, you do the exact same thing when you'd go to the grave of one of the Imams. One of the verse that they've cited is the following verse. وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ The pagans, the Quran says, they worship besides Allah, in addition to Allah. مَا لَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ What cannot benefit them and what cannot harm them. And they would claim, هَؤُلَاءِ they are shufa'auna and Allah. They are our shafi'is, our intercessors by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Quran rebukes them. They would go to their idols, send the rain, give us blessings, cure me. My child is dying, save him. And they would consider them their shufa'a. This is the practice of the mushrikeen. Yes, brother. Is the, um, the belief of the Hindus an old? Is the same as the pagans of the Mecca and Mecca? The Hindus have a different belief system than the Mushrikeen of Mecca. In one sense, they do believe in God as a creator who created them and created the heavens. But there is also some sort of paganism in their beliefs. Basically, they do consider other than God to have divine beings. They have multiple gods, multiple divine beings, and they do seek their blessings from those gods. They so, ask or they uh, use them as wasila? They do consider them wasila, that the main god has authorized them, but they do directly ask them to. They believe that that idol has the power to heal you, has the power to benefit you or harm you. They do have these types of beliefs. So it's similar maybe to the mushrikeen of Mecca, but it's also different. So in general sense they are kuffar? Yes, they are kuffar. According to Islamic law they would be considered non-believers because they do ascribe partners to Allah. And by the way there are types of Hindus. There are some Hindus who are monotheists. They only recognize God to be divine. So there are many types of Hindu sects we cannot generalize, but many of them do engage in idol worshipping. They do worship idols or animals like cattle for example or cows. They literally worship them. So this is a verse in the Holy Quran and they accuse us of doing the same thing. When we seek the wasila, we're doing the same thing. What's the response to that? First answer, Pagans would worship these idols. See the Quran says, وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Worship. When you seek the wasila of an Imam or you go to the shrine of an Imam, are you going to that shrine with the intention of worshipping it? That in itself is the main difference. That in itself is the main difference. Worship, ibadah has a clear meaning everybody understands. When I say worship, and I mean it literally, right? Not symbolically, because sometimes you could use it symbolically. Somebody is in love with money, you could say you worship money, right? But you're saying it symbolically. But when you mean it literally, ibadah means you recognize that that object which you're worshiping, the object of your worship is divine, is, is a God. This is what the pagans would do. Whereas when we seek the wasila, we don't engage in any type of worship. No Shia goes to any of these shrines with the intention of worshipping these shrines. So 
That's the first point over here. The, this is a big difference between what the pagans would do and between the one who engages in wasila. Secondly, the Quran says they put the idols with God. See? وَيَقُولُونَ هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Or in another verse, مَعَ اللَّهِ They would put their idols with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and you ask him for something, do you put him with Allah? Do you believe that he and Allah are at the same level? Just like Allah has powers, independent powers, he also has independent powers. See, that's the second difference which they're not understanding. And that's why they declare it shirk, because they have not understood it. But our question to them, what does ibadah mean? Because they could argue, see, just like you humble yourself to Allah, you're humbling yourself to these shrines. You go with a humble heart to Imam Hussein, and this is shirk. Humbling yourself to someone, is that ibadah? If you humble yourself towards a teacher, is that ibadah? In fact, the Quran says, humble yourself towards your parents. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَلْ جَنَاحَ what? See, ibadah, one of the meanings of ibadah is khudu' wa tadallul. Humbling yourself in humility. That's one of the meanings of ibadah. Now the Quran says, do this towards your parents. Is the Quran commanding us to worship our parents? What's the difference between worshiping your parents and showing humility and humbleness towards them? What's the difference? Is there a difference or they're the same? What's the difference? In simple terms, explain to me the difference between worshiping my parents and between dhul, khudu, showing them humbleness and humility. What's the difference? Worshipping is to believe that uh, the source of power, the source of everything is Allah. Whereas respecting, you're not believing that the source is from them, uh, is the original source is from Allah. Treat, treat them with mercy and respect, that's the other. Exactly, when you worship someone, you believe that this person is the source of all power in the universe, the person is the source of all that you need, this person can change your fate, can harm you, can have a big impact on your life. This is the meaning of ibadah. Whereas the respect that we are to show our parents is not ibadah. You recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created you, He's worshipped. But yes, my parents have a right on me. Because they have a right on me, I respect them. But there is a reward to that respect from Allah, that yes. you respect your parents. And that's what I'm saying, Allah is the one who's commanding you to show them that humility. So our argument with those Wahhabis is, if you define worship as just humbling yourself, Allah says humble yourself towards your parents. Does that mean Allah says commit shirk with your parents? How do you answer that question? If I were to ask a Wahhabi, what do you do towards your parents? What do you do? If your argument, <laughs> what's that? They will tell you they are, they are alive and it's okay to do it. Well, we'll get to that point whether someone's alive or dead. But we're trying to understand ibadah, khudu, humbling yourself, lowering yourself. So the Quran says lower yourself. Have you seen a, a pigeon for example or a bird that lowers its wings? Yeah. See the, the Quran says waqfil, lower. But that's not ibadah. And nobody in history has misunderstood respecting parents as ibadah and mistook, mistaken it. Nobody does that, it's clear. Even if you go in front of your parents and you just lower yourself like that, it's not ibadah. It's, it's humbleness and respect. So that's our first response if they accuse us of committing Shirk because we're worshipping the Imams. If worship means to ask for help, because sometimes they could tell you worshipping means you're asking for help and you can only ask help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If worship means that you ask for help, then if you ask for help from someone who's alive in your life, is that shirk? You need something done and you ask for help. 
Come here and help me. Let's lift this heavy item. Is that shirk? No. Why not? You're asking for help. You can only ask Allah for help. Why is that not shirk? Because God is the source of all help, but we're asking the cre creation for help, not the creator. He's helping me. So why, when you ask the creation for help, that's not shirk? Why is it not shirk? In the end, you're asking other than God. Because Zaid, whom you just asked for help, is other than God. It's not God. He's the creation of God. So when you ask Zaid for help, why is that not shirk? Because you all agree that's not shirk, mm -hmm. right? But why is it not shirk? We don't believe Zaid has the original power aside from Allah. To, yeah. to See, you don't believe that Zaid has independent powers from Allah. If Zaid has any power to help me, it's because Allah has given him that power and I'm using the power that Allah has given him. Recognize it that Allah is the source of all power. That's why it's not shirk. Yes, if you were to ask Zaid for help, believing that Zaid is the source of power, independent of God, that would be shirk. That would be shirk. So if their definition of ibadah means asking for help, then it's impossible not to commit shirk in your life because you're going to ask for help somebody from someone someday in your life and that's not the case. Prophets would ask people for help sometimes. So that definition of ibadah which the pagans would ascribe to their partners and engage in is not something that you find any Shia Muslim doing or even any Muslim, even the Sufis when they go to their saints, that's not something that they do. They don't worship that grave or that shrine, believing that it has independent powers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, the most thing that they could say, and we'll examine this of course, it's useless if the person is dead. If the person's alive, he has the power to help you, so it makes sense to ask them for help. But if the person is dead, what's the point? It's like asking a wall, help me. It's just useless. If today, if today I sit here in front of you, I look at this water bottle and I say, water bottle, help me please. <laughs> Am I a mushrik? No. Suddenly I became a mushrik? No, but the most thing that you could say is what? It's useless, right? It's not going to help you. Don't waste your time. That's the most thing they could say which will examine too and reject that, will prove how it does make a difference. But the most thing that they could say to us, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, you're doing something that's useless. But shirk, blasphemy, why? Why? Where did that come from? Why is it shirk? If I believe that this has powers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't. Okay, in your eyes, I'm doing something useless. I'm wasting my time. But why is it shirk? How does that make me worship that object? If right now I ask this water to help me, that means I'm worshiping this water? So you see the flaw in their mentality. Now, let's further expand on this idea of calling on someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran states, وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. What the Quran prohibits is calling other than Allah with Him as a Lord. See, وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ Do not call with Allah إِلَهًا آخر, Another Lord. So the Quran mentions two things here. One is that that which the pagans would call upon, they would put it with Allah, number one. Number two, they would recognize it as a what? Aliha, as a Lord. And that's why the Quran condemns them and rejects that. But when you call and you say, Ya Hussein, Ya Muhammad, are you putting them with Allah? No. Are you seeing them as a Lord, as an Ilah? No. So there's a big difference between the two. They have no right to compare these two. The Quran is talking about a different scenario. Yes. Is that something the belief of the Alawis have confused with the rest? Of yes, there are some deviant sects like the Alawis who believe Allah was physically manifested in Imam Ali or Imam Ali basically embodied God. We also agree that that's disbelief. 
Not all Alawis, because there are types of Alawis, but there is one group of Alawis who are disbelievers. No doubt about that. Oh, there are groups of Alawis? Yes, there are types of Alawis. There are Alawis who have a lot of respect for Imam Ali. They consider him the source of the sciences and the knowledge and the tariqahs that we have. They're not um, mushriks. They don't believe he's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there is one strand of Alawis and there are many, they're not, you know, they're not too few, there are many of them, millions probably. Oh. oh yes, there are millions in Turkey and Syria. They do believe Imam Ali was God or the embodiment of Allah. And that's blasphemy, we also agree. We also condemn that type of belief. But this is not mainstream Shias, this is not what the followers of Ahlul Bayt believe in. So maybe this Wahhabism, they are not... No, no, they specifically are examining our belief system. When we say Ya Hussein, they, <coughs> they do know the difference. They, know. they know the big difference between Alawis and mainstream Shia, yet they insist that the Shias are blasphemous and that they're kuffar or mushrik. They do know the difference, it's very clear. So we don't put any of them with God. We don't put the Prophet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't consider the Prophet to be an aliha. Now third point, if asking someone for help is shirk, then it's shirk whether that person is alive or dead. What difference does it make? If it's shirk, it's shirk. If you're putting that person with God, what, it, what difference does it make if they're alive or dead? What difference does it make? Should not make a difference. If it's shirk, it's shirk. Which reveals the flaw in their argument that when you ask someone alive to help you, you do recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will ultimately help you, but He's just a tool that you're using. Same with those who passed away, these are tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. The fourth point over here, and this is very important, when it comes to idols, Allah clearly says, I never gave them permission. Allah says, I didn't give them permission to intercede on your behalf. I never authorized them. I never allowed you to go and seek their help. Whereas when it comes to the prophets and the righteous servants and the Ahlul Bayt, Allah says, I have authorized them. I have given them the power of shafa. That's a big difference because Allah ultimately decides who gets shafa and who doesn't. Allah clearly says those idols, those stones, I have not given them shafa. So I'll condemn you if you go and ask them for shafa. But the Ahlul Bayt, I have given them the shafa. The Prophet, I have given him shafa. That in itself makes a big, big difference over here.